Hey, kids, you remember me? (laughs) I know, I know, it's been a bit sporadic, but we are back this week with another conversation episode, and it's a good one, okay? Because our guest this week is no less than the great Adam Stanley himself. Drummer extraordinaire, currently of the very popular and long-standing UK rock band Breed 7-7. Adam is also, as of very recently, a podcaster. Now, he grew up in South Africa, okay? And he grew up in a very compelling time in that country's history. He was born and grew up in the 80s and 90s. And at that time, Apartheid was ending in South Africa, and a new South Africa was emerging, and with it, a new South African music scene. He grew up and came of age in that scene, and he has recently launched a podcast called Caught in Time, which is an homage and a documentation of that period in South Africa's musical history. So it's interviews with the people who were part of that scene and who made that scene, Reflections on some of those bands, conversations with those people. Really, really cool and ambitious project. And it was my pleasure to talk to Adam Stanley about that podcast, about moving to the UK to pursue his musical dream, about the ups and downs of that experience, and just what he's been up to. He's a really, really super guy, terrific drummer really inspirational figure. It was my sincere pleasure to chat with him, and I hope also sincerely that you enjoy this conversation with the great Adam Stanley. John of Podcast. What a treat this is. <laughs> yeah, for me as well. Yeah, this is, uh, it's actually kind of a long time coming. So I want to start just by saying thank you to you for supporting this program and telling me that you support this program. (laughs) Does no one tell you or do not enough people tell you? (laughs) Well, I don't know if there's ever going to be enough people telling me that. Yeah. (laughs) But you're one of the ones who has done so. I mean, it. You probably have learned what it's like to feel as though you're working in isolation sometimes, you know? Very much, yeah. And so a couple of years ago, I got an unsolicited message from you via Instagram, <laughs> just of support and encouragement. And that goes a long way. I often encourage people to do that, whether it's a podcaster you like or an artist or whatever. It's just like, Send a, that person a message and you can give them fuel for weeks, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, that's absolutely bang on. I mean, we have our, our mutual friend, Emily Dolan Davis, um, and that's how I made friends with her, by just annoying her on Instagram, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and on top of that, I just yeah. want to say congratulations to you. And I recognize all of the work that you're putting into all of the stuff you're doing. And I don't know if enough people are telling you that, but I'm noticing and I'm impressed and congratulations to you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. No, I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's good to hear someone other than my wife say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see. I mean, we're going to talk about all of this stuff. But just what you're putting into marketing yourself as a musician, as a recording musician, now this podcast that you've launched, and I see the presence you have on social media, and really the work that you're putting into all of that is really, really commendable. And it's the same thing. A lot of times we just don't always tell people that we notice what they're doing. So I notice what you're doing, man. (laughs) Thank you, man. I appreciate that. That's, that's very inspiring. Thank you. So let's, let's begin at the beginning. You grew up in South Africa. Yeah. Um, born in 1980 in uh, Durban, which is kind of significant to, to the whole podcast thing. Um, and then moved to a small town inland called Pietermaritzburg uh, when I was three. 
um, went to school, and I would say lived quite a like a sheltered sort of life, which is also like important because that when I was thirteen or fourteen, I you know when you go to high school and uh, I didn't know anything about guitar rock at all. You really, know, I wasn't in the house. No, no, my parents, bless them. Uh, our car trips had a lot of like uh, ABBA and uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber kind of stuff, and maybe a bit of Dire Straits. You know, that was about as as guitar-y as it went. You know, and then I went to school, uh, and this guy I think took pity on me, and he he was like, uh, "Have you heard uh, Metallica?" And he gave me "Injustice for All." So I put that on it, as, never having heard anything i did i didn't know anything about anything so i put this in and straight away it was like oh okay that's what's been missing <laughs> wow yeah so and he had a drum set in his room so i'd go to his house and i'd bash around and i think he got frustrated one day and he was like uh you need to play this and he thought i couldn't play it so he played you know that beat um and I just played it from watching him. And I think he was like, oh, shit. And then from there, I would play on my bed and the whole thing. And then my parents eventually bought me a, a drum set. And just after that, um, I saw in the local paper that there was a, a local bar called the Buzz Bar that was holding uh, like matinee shows. And uh, I started going to gigs there. Uh, because I was able to see live bands and that was kind of my kick off into music you know the rest of my early life is probably quite boring <laughs> that's not a bad thing yeah you know I mean better in some ways to have a boring early life than a really tragic one although people turn tragedy into great art but you know the gentle childhood is not such a bad thing no I, I think it's uh it can give you like a like a foil almost, you know, because it sets you up for who you are. But then I found like, I don't know if you relate, but I needed something more, like a bit more excitement. Mm. So it, it, it's the light, light and dark contrast type thing. You know what I mean? What was it like? I mean, South Africa is almost as far away as you can get from Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was South Africa like in the 90s and the 80s? I know that's a huge a huge question and but you know <laughs> well it's I remember the kind of distinct change marker and the kind of the way everyone changed and how I definitely changed my ways of thinking and and what have you because in the 80s you know it was still like apartheid was very strong mm -hmm. um it's very significant to the whole thing as well uh, and I think the example that was set by a lot of older people around us, you know, even people not older, not much older than myself, was not very good, shall we say, and was in line with that way of thinking. So you grow up not knowing any better about certain things. Uh, and then, the, you know, Nelson Mandela was released from prison and then we all started to learn you know, or I personally started to learn the the whole story kind of thing, and mm -hmm. then you then you realize like how much of your life was really wrong. You know, not that I had a bad childhood, I had a wonderful time. You know what I mean? It's not that's almost got nothing to do with it, but the the country and the culture and the attitude side of it was for me was I was like, oh wow. So you know, that's always in my head when because there's so much stuff going on now in the world. Um, and people will say things to me like, oh, you're from South Africa, aren't you guys? They're, I've been called a Nazi. <laughs> you know, I've been called all this just because of where I'm from. Sure. And uh, it, it, it's quite because of that, that change that I spoke about in my, my mind. And I think the whole national consciousness, it, it, I'm quite sensitive to that sort of thing. So, yeah, without going down that whole rabbit hole too far, um, that was a big part of of growing up, you know. The other side of it was uh, this really, really great lifestyle that people still enjoy in South Africa, where it's quite um, it's quite free, and I think people don't sweat a lot of things as much as they might do, you know. Uh, certainly in in England, um, it's uh, like the rules are a little <laughs> a little wonky, and really? sometimes 
that's not a bad thing if you know. I don't know if you know what I mean, but uh, it's a cool lifestyle. It's really interesting to kind of observe that from a distance because every place changes, right? Canada's yeah. changed too, but that kind of seismic cultural change, that's not something really that I've experienced or that we've experienced here. And I kind of, I watch what's going on in the States right now because being in Canada, you can't avoid it. Mm. And I just see a lot of fear around change. And I understand that, I guess, to a certain extent. But it's like we've lived in a weird way, kind of a sheltered existence in North America where things have been fairly safe, not a huge amount of change. And I don't know how well we deal with it. Because I think about places like, not that this is supposed to be about any of this, but... It's, it's relevant. It is, because it's the world. I think about Gaza, I think about Ukraine, and I think about how quickly things can change for the worse, for the better. And we don't experience that here very much. <laughs> it's just interesting to observe how that affects a person. I mean, I would say that sounds pretty great, to be honest. <laughs> I, I, but it it does. It has a it has a an effect on you. I mean, on every individual that will be different. But in terms of how we lived in our whole country and all my friends and the way, like it made certain things happen for a reason. And mm. uh, that's kind of actually almost led to us talking today. So it's... Yeah, it is. So you, you get handed a Metallica CD. Yeah, tape. A tape. A tape, sorry. Tape. No, no CDs until later. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. And that's like a game changer for you. Yeah. And then it's drums. Was it always drums? Because like, you play everything, right? <laughs> You're one of those people. I, a jack of all trades, master of, of none. Although I tried to be a master of drum. <laughs> well, I mean, dude, your playing is pretty hot. So thank you. You're, you're pretty get, getting pretty close to mastery there <laughs> with what you're uh, doing. I was trying to work out if I'd actually put in 10,000 hours the other day. And I, I don't think I ever will. But Which you can put in 10,000 hours in the wrong direction and still be kind of nowhere, right? <laughs> like with drumming, what, what are you putting the 10,000 hours into exactly? Because. Yeah. It's a kind of a big subject, you know, and you you could do it. You know, I, yeah, like I, I I was the same in a certain sense. I didn't really sit down and behind a drum kit until I was fourteen or fifteen. Much as I loved music growing up and was a was a huge music person, but I kind of had a sense that I could play the drums without knowing I could. <laughs> and then yeah. all of a sudden, I just sat down behind a drum kit and I could do it. That wasn't great. I'm still not great, but uh, the mechanics I could actually do, it's a weird thing. It was like that for you too, it sounds like. Yeah. As you say that, I was like, it's, it was no, no greater than that. It was just like, I think I can do it. I don't know. <laughs> um, I've never heard your playing. I don't, you don't seem to have a lot of stuff up of your I mean, playing. I've got, there's stuff that I've recorded that's out in the world, but I don't have right. a lot of videos or anything like that. I'm not really equipped to do that. Um, in terms of actually recording stuff or doing things. I think about that sometimes and I, I become very reluctant in a weird way. Like, um, cause mm. people do such amazing stuff. You know, if you go on the Instagram or whatever, and it's not just their playing, it's the ability to record well, to record good sounds, to record good video. And there's a whole kind of tech angle on that that is not my forte so i don't have a lot of me playing out there and you're not missing much <laughs> it you know <laughs> I, i'm a pretty meat and potatoes kind of a guy but i come back to the meat and potatoes more and more um the more and more i try and you know get into the spicy stuff the more i realize that i'm doing it too late in life and i the really meat and potatoes, yeah yeah oh tell me more about that well I never focused on technique when I was younger, um, me neither. which is really like, really frustrates me now. <laughs> it's like fitness. You're like, I better go to the gym now because my back hurts rather than yeah. I've always been into it. You know what I mean? It's the same kind of thing. Um, 
but yeah, I, I knew some stuff, but I didn't understand about the mechanics of how my body moved with the drums until not that long ago, you know. Um, so then you start, I mean, you start trying to catch up with people, um, whether it's, it used to be someone in your hometown who's the best drummer type thing. And you're like, oh, I want to play like that guy. And then now it's the whole world, which is it's a bit <laughs> self-defeating, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah, and that there's a lot of, there's a certain amount of deception happening, right? Because you'll see the Instagram drummer doing that amazing clip for 15 seconds, but you don't see how many takes that was, and you don't see how much manipulation is going on. And I think it's contextual. I mean, most of what I play is singer-songwriter. It's Americana. It doesn't want 30-second note double bass fills. Yeah. So I don't do that. <laughs> It's sort of like this isn't sports, and the more into sports territory it goes, the more depressed I feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you said something. Sorry, go yeah. ahead. I was just going to say we recorded a song with my. I have a band with my wife. It's like a progressive medley alter, alternative band, and the ten the temptation there is to do tricks, you know. Of course. And I wrote this whole drum part. It took me a month to write this drum part, and. After a while of playing it, one of the guys was like, it's just a bit, it's a bit much. And he's like, it's very good. But he's like, you know, and then he said, why didn't, he kind of inferred, why didn't you strip it down? And when I recorded it stripped down, it sounded way bigger. And I was relaxed when I played it. I wasn't right. going, oh, fuck that bit, <laughs> you know. Of um, course, yeah. You know, and that lesson happens over and over and over again with recording it's like does it sound good like this usually it doesn't so like yeah meat and potatoes is mean it, it tastes the best the fundamentals are still the fundamentals i mean you you play a lot more rock than i do you play a lot more metal than i do that's a different flavor of meat and potatoes yeah but it it's still got a groove it's still got to feel right you know? yeah but i don't do a, really any of that anymore when i when i was i'm a little bit older than you so i grew up in the heyday of hair metal 80s rock everything was huge drum kits a lot of showmanship a lot of just that whole thing and that was the music of my youth that's what i grew up on and so that informs your playing but as i've it, it's just worked out that as a drummer i've wound up in this kind of singer songwriter world where it's just not that you know if i can go out and i do this often with a kick a floor tom and a snare drum i'm happy as can possibly be with that minimal configuration playing minimal stuff that feels so good to me and it doesn't always lend itself to a great social media clip <laughs> like here's me playing two and four uh, i think because you, you said something that made, you know, you were saying about the recording side of it. And I also don't consider myself a technician. And every time I've sat down to do something technical to put on the camera, it sounds bad. And I don't really want to put it out. Yeah. So I don't put those things out because it's contrived, right? So right. then I thought, well, if I want to put something up, it has to sound good. So I'd better get a little bit better at recording it. You know, if I'm going to do two and four then at least make it sound great and then maybe treat the viewers to two or three camera angles and then it keeps the kind of entertainment factor in yeah. something that's simple. And you just got to play it like you mean it. So that's what I, you know, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but that, that's what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> when did you leave South Africa? 2006. It's actually the 18-year anniversary like now. So Oh, really? There we go, yeah. Tell us that story. How come you left? It was to pursue music. And so I was like 25. Uh, and I joined this band called The City Bowl Misers, which is a bizarre name. They were a bit younger than me, quite a bit younger than me, um, actually. Um, but really great songwriters and performers. Very green. I think they'll admit that if they, if they hear this. And they were very gung-ho. And one of the parents was like managing the band. And he's like, you guys have got to get to London. This is the kind of thing. And he wasn't wrong, you know, because at the time there was like, a, it was like Franz Ferdinand and all mm. that kind of stuff going on. So it sort of fit in that wheelhouse. 
Um, so we came over um, and started gigging and started to build a following. But because they were so young and frankly disorganized, they didn't have their work permits sorted out and they had to go back. And I think they didn't really, they didn't like it. But I was in a different position where I was like, I need to like, I need a career or like, I don't have any money. My parents aren't supporting me, you know? Yeah. Um, so I went back with them and then that was kind of compounded. I was like, yeah, you don't have a car. You don't have a house. You're bumming around. You know what I mean? This is not good. So I came back here and did the whole like nine to five thing in the day, playing music in the evening for years, basically. What was your nine to five? What were you working at? <laughs> I think... What was the first one? It was like a call center um, for a company that sells. Uh, I don't know if you have this in Canada, but it's like gift experiences. Oh. Yeah. Um, Maybe. We probably do. Something like it, it's. They'll be like, you can go Ferrari driving or it'll be meal out <laughs> or like all kinds of stuff. There was like a thousand different experiences and I was on the phone, you know, <laughs> that was my nine to five. And then I think it. I can't remember what I did. I did that sort of thing. And then I went back to university and did like a photography science degree that I don't use now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back and I became a copywriter, which I'm actually doing now. Uh, it's my main, my main thing. Uh, and while I was doing that, I was like, fuck, like, this is starting to get me down. I want to do music full time. And it eventually it took about five years, six years of that. For me to finally go, I need to um, do music. So that's like a nutshell version of it. I mean, at the start of my time of coming back to the UK, I started a band with my wife, um, which you may, I don't know if I've shown you that before. Which, what's the name of that band? Because you've been a bunch of bands. It's called The Mariana Hollow. Yeah, okay. I have, I have listened to some of that stuff. Yeah. So that band is still going. Um, and we, okay. we were quite gung-ho for a while about that. And started yeah. to build a following too but you know these things don't always go um but yeah that's still going and uh i was involved i got in into all sorts of music projects while i was here and i guess that was like what you could call the start of trying to be a session musician and you put your, yeah. your little ad up on gum tree i think in the beginning that's all you could do and then people would get in touch and you do either horrendous little gigs um but then someone <laughs> remembers you from the horrendous gig and then you go and do a slightly cooler gig from that and then someone finds your profile and then I, I don't know i ended up just playing with loads and loads of bands and i 2017 i got i mean this is going to link back to some of the south africa stuff but some someone i know in quite a prominent us band who is south african hooked me up with a band called lieutenant or ltnt uh, and took us on tour with with his band um, around Europe and that was the catalyst for me to go uh, I'm gonna do music full-time so yeah yeah that's kind of a I mean there's so much to it but what is London like to relocate to I mean is that is that a difficult thing to, it's got to be a difficult thing to do yeah, Whew, yeah. it's a I think of a PTSD <laughs> really <laughs> a bit, yeah um that whole that word disorganized I used earlier was uh, is part of that because I came over with about I had like 250 pounds and I had to give a bunch of that up almost immediately for my first period of rent uh, and then quickly go and find a job. So it was really difficult, like with no money. Yeah. And people's, the culture is totally different. It was super fast. Where we come from, it's like a surfer town, you know, it's like Malibu. <laughs> oh. London is so not that. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. And I kind of liked some of it because I liked some of the freedom you get with functioning public transport, which is not a thing in South Africa for the most part. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. And, um, you know, I, I had a bit of like autonomy, so I enjoyed that. But then there was also stuff like there's a lot of rules. There's a lot of like kind of what's how can I put it? You're limited in other ways that you didn't know you were limited and things happen like this. And the demand, yeah, demanding. It's a demanding lifestyle that uh, took me ages to assimilate with, you know. Uh, yeah. I actually live outside London now, uh, which is a bit nicer. Sure, out of the sort of the, the heat of it all. I mean, were there moments when you thought, 
this is not going to work for me. Yeah. I got to go back home. Yeah. Yeah. Many, you know, uh, even up until like, just like six years in, you know, I was still like, I don't know about this so much, you know. Also with the band scene, like this is really relevant to the, the podcast and why I wanted to capture the whole South African music scene is a local scene is a very precious thing. And if you're a part of it, you can, aside from feeling like a big fish in a small pond, which is just a very nice feeling for your ego, the community, <laughs> the community side of it is the actual thing that's important. And that's why you like right. being there. And when, you, when I came over here, no one gave a shit what I'd done over there or who the most famous bands there were or how that informed my approach. Nothing. So none of that was important. And that was quite difficult to, to deal with as well. Um, because to me, that was part of my identity, you know. Sure. I'm not trying to sound too down in the dumps about it or anything. I'm just saying those are the challenges, you know. But then also, the standard of the good players here made me want to kind of step up, you know. And also, the not so good players made me re realize what I was worth, I suppose, and gave me a bit of courage to step out. Absolutely. So if you're coming from a what's a relatively small scene, which I suspect you were in South Africa. Yeah. Coming into a city like London, where I would assume that much of the entertainment industry is centered there and the music industry is centered there in, in London, presumably. Mm. Am I wrong about that? No, that's, that's bang on. Yeah, like you're, you're suddenly walking into this probably endless opportunity, but also endless competition. <laughs> And not knowing where to, to, to turn with it, yeah. Right. Absolutely, yeah. You just made me think of something by saying that. And some years in to trying to crack something over here, I started to look at my friends and contemporaries from South Africa and some of the kind of big bands from the 90s, while the kind of music explosion had died down, which is the whole focus of my podcast, um, mm -hmm. while that is sort of, you know, it, things run their course like anything. Um, but the, the, there were many of the top bands that are, they are still doing stuff now for a reason. Um, and some of my friends were finding new opportunities that were actually not only sending them around South Africa, having a good time, but propelling them to tour Europe and doing all the stuff that almost felt out of well no not almost it did feel out of reach when i was there and i was like oh well you will never get it we'll never get overseas you you very much felt in a, a bubble when i was there and you could there was like a glass ceiling to the industry and you could see the trajectory and you knew he was at the top and everyone but you were also like once you were playing in the scene in a certain capacity you would play with those people you just maybe weren't as popular as they were so you could see the whole thing in front of you. Whereas when you come to London, it's like, where do I go now? Who, who do I speak to? How, how does this all work? And I would look back and see my friends doing well and going and go at that time, oh, I think I missed a trick here. They seem to be making this work and they're thriving. And I wonder if I was doing a whole grass is greener type thing instead of looking at how cool what I had was right in front of me. So that thought process, while it's, you know, that's kind of changed over the years, but it's really, really been inspirational for trying to do this podcast. So that's probably one of the main things, actually. One thing that really struck me about the South African scene is the resilience of a lot of those bands and those people. Because, um, you know, there were so many bands that after a while. It's like there were not any bands before a certain point and then there were some amazing bands and people started writing their own songs and then there was loads of bands we all we all had bands and eventually they dropped by the wayside but the resilience and the kind of what's the word there was even foresight i think in the part of some of the main people who are right at the top of the scene um is is quite amazing um so i'll name some people because it's important um, so like the household names in South Africa, there's a band called Springbok Nude Girls, uh, which is a strange band name. It's quite a funny story behind it. Uh, there's a band called Fuck Off Policicard, which is a, they sing in Afrikaans. It's like, kind of like punk rock, but Afrikaans. It sounds aggressive. Kind of. It's more like highbrow, socially conscious with 
quite deft musicianship. Like it's not as blunt as the name. It is as blunt as the name sounds, but it's also not. I'll send you some. But it's all in Afrikaans, so you might need a translation of the, the lyrics. But those guys took what was there and they run with it. There's another band called Vonoboom, um, which means wonder tree, which obviously refers to, um, you know, a town in South Africa called Vonoboom, actually. But there's a, a there you're doing the universal marijuana smoking. Yeah, I mean, they'll you're... probably go, that's not it. Uh, I don't, I don't think it, it might, I don't know it necessarily is that. Anyway, I'm digressing. But these guys are still around and they're doing very well and they've kind of branched out into other things as well. There's like solo ventures by people's, people in those bands and they have a resilience that I really respect and I think is quite unique to, to being in that country, you know, because it's not easy there. It's easy in a way to get onto like a festival stage, whereas that's not easy here. But, but to maintain that level and get, maintain an income and maintain people caring about you, that is way harder over there, I think, because there is a glass ceiling and you can saturate because the rock market's pretty small. Canada's probably similar. It's just geographically huge, but not a huge population. So it's, it's very difficult to have a career, a full-time career just here. It's like you have to be touring in the States. You have to be touring in Europe. There's yeah. just like a, a Canadian tour takes two weeks. <laughs> you, you've, you've hit all the spots, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your podcast is Caught in Time. Yeah. We've alluded to this, but it, it's to do with that South African scene of the 90s, 2000s. Yeah. You talk about this influx of music beginning to happen during that period. Why? Is there a, a good reason why all of a sudden that began to blossom in those days? Yeah. I mean, some of it's personal, you know, connection, but there was literally like a, almost like a dividing line and it did come with the country changing. Um, hmm. And the culture changing with that, like it's quite amazing. Some of the people on the podcast who are older than me will explain this better as well. But um, prior to like 1993 or 94, I think that not that they weren't a lot of any original bands, but there was a lot of cover bands. There was this whole culture of, of that. And music from overseas was largely sanctioned as well. Lots of stuff from overseas, or overseas imposed sanctions on South Africa. Sorry, that's the correct way of putting it. Oh, interesting. So we didn't get a lot of stuff, and we certainly didn't get people coming on tour. So that's a huge factor. Like, sure. there's not a lot of that. So I think people would eventually, like, start to make their own music. There was a couple of really standout bands, like Rabbit, uh, Cinema, Evoid. These are all names that are, you know, from the 80s. The music was of the 80s and then Trevor Rabin you may have heard of him um he went on to become a prolific international songwriter um uh, from Rabbit sorry he was in the band Rabbit uh if you look him up you'll see his in incredible CV but um there were these kind of bands um and loads of cover bands and then the country kind of changed its politics and the culture changed very quickly you know and it was almost like someone went like, yeah, it's, it's fine to have your own bands now. I think there was a lot of protest music before that, like Afrikaans protest music. Again, my Afrikaans guests will, be, will explain this better. Um, but there's like, you know, Valiant Swat, Kurs Kumbais, people like this was doing these kind of intelligent protest songs. But it wasn't like mainstream, in it. well, for obvious reasons, you know. And then all of a sudden, I think it, around about the time when I got into music and as I said earlier, um, all these bands started to come out and serendipitously, my friend Roly, who was my first guest, opened this place called The Buzz Bar in our hometown. And he's, as he says in the podcast, we opened this place and there just so happened to be like suddenly 40, 50 original bands just needing somewhere to play. So they all started playing there and he would run these matinee sections, sessions be purely because he knew people wanted to hear music, out, uh, purely out of doing a nice thing. I think they were making a loss <laughs> on these sessions. And venues would just pop up around the country uh, and radio, which would n radio never played um, a lot of rock music full stop, but 
it was very conservative radio stuff and like to get rock stuff on the on daytime radio was like what so local bands that was even more what <laughs> that's not happening you know but slowly people, there was a guy who worked at Jacaranda FM called Barney Simon and he went on to work at 5 FM which is kind of like a BBC one it's like the main station in the country and they gave him a nighttime show and it was like 11 o'clock till two in the morning or something um, it was called Barney Simon's Night Zoo and uh, he had a whole theme tune and everything like a, a, like a sound collage and then he would play metal you know so now we all get to hear metal uh, that we want to hear like really heavy stuff new metal light stuff whatever and he would play people's fucking demos Oh wow. a lot you know so he he would play some of the bands that oh, I'm interviewing, he'd play their stuff when they came out. They were like nobodies, but it would start to catch on. And all the kids would be like taping the radio show. You know how you used to put a tape in the radio? And oh, was, yeah. Oh, of, of course you did that. I sure did. So this was really significant. And I, I'm trying to get Barney on, actually, but he, he hasn't responded to my emails, Barney. Uh, <laughs> and... I just think it, it sparked something and all of a sudden there was more interest, little festivals started popping up uh, and the, as I said, venues started popping up, bands started being able to tour, marketing kicked in around that. There was a, a publication called Top 40 Magazine, which you can imagine what that is and it started to be, it ha- would have like Nirvana on the cover, Pearl Jam and all this stuff that was popular then. But you open it up, and then there's all the local bands right next to them. So those became everybody's heroes. Because we all thought, and at school going age, we're never going to see Metallica. We're never going to see these people. They're like fucking space aliens. Um, right. You know, that was the mentality. So all the, for me, at least, all the local bands were like, that's my heroes. And some of them would send newsletters out, so that connection gets established. Sure. Uh, a band called Lithium from Cape Town would do that. And so I was like, yeah, I'm a fan for life now because you wrote to me by hand. You know, you sent me this. Wow. And, yeah, super cool. Like proper, like old school DIY. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you can go and see them. You And you could go and shake hands with them afterwards and get them to sign your posters and what have you. And that was m- really meaningful. So I'd have their records. I'd play them at home. And my drumming influences, as a result, because there weren't a lot of metal bands in the scene at the time, like Double Kick, you know, crazy. Yeah, yeah. It was more rock in various flavors. So my influences were more that way inclined, which is another reason why I'm not a super technical drummer today, because it was more about the songs and the live performance um, than about the technicality. Not that people weren't technical and incredible, but... They weren't technical in that kind of showboat way, if you know what I mean. Hmm. Yeah, so it's quite hard to sum this up, and I've already been waffling a lot about it. But um, well, this is fascinating. It's, Keep going. it's really like it's very difficult to bottle it. I want to bottle it, but I know I'll never do that. And as this thing got bigger and bigger, certain bands rose to the top, you know, and then they became household names. And then you'd see them on the TV or whatever, being interviewed in prime time. And now this, th- now this is a thing. And it, the, someone put a name on it and they called it the South African Music Explosion. So it, it really was. And it sounds really corny to somebody who wasn't there. But our country had nothing. Not nothing, but it was, it was very different to like growing up in England where, you know, Black Sabbath comes from England. So... That's your, you know what I mean? It's quite a yeah, significant yeah. difference. Um, we didn't have that during that time. To now there's bands playing their own songs, doing quite, quite diverse takes on rock. So it's not like there's people going, okay, we want to sound like Pearl Jam. But then there's other people bringing in trumpets and African instruments and African, there's an Africanness to it, even if it didn't sound like, you know, what you might imagine African music sounds like. Well, I wanted to ask you if, if some of that came into the music. Yeah. Because South Africa's in Africa. <laughs> yeah. And some of it would come out directly. And I think more later on that it would be more directly 
incorporated in, into the rock bands. I'm, there's, there are other bands as well that were playing like fusion and jazz. And the jazz and, and fusion bands were more influenced by um, local things, you know. So you get African jazz and you could hear, this is African jazz. You could hear that kind of stuff coming through, you know. But the rock bands that were part of my little, little tiny world were taking Western influences. And then there's a South African-ness that I can't, again, I can't bottle it, but that was part of the music. It's like, sure. we're going to fucking try anything. We're going to try whatever we want. We think this is cool. It's a bit eccentric. It, eccentric, it, it, that's what it is. And it's, it's mm. kind of like 100 miles an hour. And that, that made its way into the music. So um, every band ended up being very different. If you think of, uh, if you think of the Seattle bands, they don't sound the same, you know, mm. the, the big yeah. four Seattle bands and everyone's like, oh, it's grunge. I'm like, well, is it? Because they all sound like different rock to me. It's not right. But you know what I mean? If you, if you listen to Soundgarden, that's actually prog. It's not really mm. like grunge. It's, it's very sophisticated. And Nirvana is like peel the paint from the walls and then, you know. So the same with the South African bands. It's like Springbok Nude Girls has a fucking trumpet and a keyboard, but metal riffs as well. Right. And really slow songs that are pretty pretty. And that's all going on one record. And then we have like Squeal, which is from Durban. They're more like a classic punk with a David Bowie overtone and the, the cult kind of mixed in there. And then the next band is like, I, I can't, you know, a trio with bass. And again, this, the brass is huge, a brass instrument and drums and a lead singer in drag being fucking wow. weird, you know, and this is the rock scene. <laughs> Everyone just plays together and that's, I, I like it because it's weird. It's weird, but it works. Let's see. That's so unlike the way it kind of is, particularly in the US, because everything has to be so labelable. You know what I mean? Yes. Like you have to fit in a box and anything that's sort of eccentric or eclectic or different from what sells right now is it, it's possible to do that, but you're automatically going to be just working on a smaller level. Like it, you just, it's like the mainstream only allows certain categories. And if you don't fit in them exactly, it's just not going to work. Mm. At least in the eighties, nineties, it's the internet has, has opened up you can be exposed in much different ways now but in the glory days if you didn't fit in the box you pretty much weren't gonna make it and it sounds like in south africa there was a lot more openness to stuff exactly that's absolutely yeah. accurate yeah yeah and i it hadn't occurred to me that south africa was maybe as isolated as it was during apartheid hmm. Right, that's right. It makes me th it makes me think of East Germany in the fifties and sixties. It's like it's this isolated kind of place, and the Western influences weren't so prevalent. Yeah, you know. And then this idea of of not really having that music to hear, and not having those bands touring in your country, and then bands from your country not really being able to go beyond it. That never occurred to me because I'd, I'd not had that experience, right? I have not lived that. Yeah. And that is the hardest thing to communicate and to make people even care about as well who are not from there. And that's what I'm kind of trying to do. One side of the whole thing is um, I, I think recording technology and methods when this whole scene started was not great. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you listen to it, you can hear the evolution of that. And some of it really doesn't sound great. And it, to the point where, like, I think modern audiences might overlook the quality of the songwriting and the passion because this, it doesn't sound like the fucking perfect triggered sound that we're used to now, you know? Right. But if you go and just spend some time with it, you'll be like, this is, it's like brilliant. It's brilliant because no one, if no one was trying to sell anything, that's really important. We're all isolated. We're just trying to make the best, craziest thing we can. Uh, and, oh, look, everyone's got like 
all sorts of different versions of that. Yeah, there's always going to be people who go like, yeah, we want to sound like that band, and then they they sound like that band, and then that quickly people will forget about them if they don't, yes, of course, you know, write good songs. Like anywhere in the world has that, but um, the all the standout bands from South Africa are wildly disparate, but they all play in that on the same bill. I think maybe later on there was, you know. Once people realized there was money to be made with certain things, then obviously you can tell like who's going to be popular because it's more palatable, but it doesn't take away from the integrity of what they were still doing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like I used to kind of, being a meddler little shit, I used to kind of turn my nose <laughs> at, up at some of that stuff, you know, now some of those bands are still going and I'm like, okay, I think... I think they were doing the right thing and I was I was wrong, you know. Um so yeah, that that's kind of what I want to bottle and I, I'm gonna try and uh include playlists and links with all my, my episodes where I can. Because some of the stuff is most of the stuff is not documented very well at all. And in fact some of the bands are not even up on social media because most of the music is not published through or a large portion of it it's not published through like major companies some of it's like sony licensed for example um Mm -hmm. or universal and so you'll hear in some of the episodes i can only have little clips of songs (laughs) but then yeah in some of them i'll have whole tracks playing or big sections that i can highlight so the point i'm trying to make there is that it some because it's generated by the bands themselves if they're older, later in their lives, maybe they just can't be asked to put it up at the stage, and they're like, "Look, we, you know, it's it's crazy." I mean, especially if if you were making that music before streaming existed, you know, it's not really part of your consciousness to put things online no. that way. No. So, I mean, you are at this point. You've got two episodes published at this point. Is that right? Just two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're brand new here. Yeah. How long have you been working this over, though? How long have you been thinking about doing oh, this? The actual podcast, probably a, a year or at least 18 months, something like that. But the idea for it was, again, my dear friend Roly, who's the first interviewee, because we had a band together as well. Um, mm. So we're very close. And he was always going on about this stuff is not documented. Like, look at all those stories. Look at all these crazy people. Like, that's you know, it's magic. We need to make a film. We need to make a coffee table book. And that, when he said that, it just stuck in my head. Yeah. But those things are very expensive and difficult to pull off. You know, no kidding. Yeah. So I'm not going to do that. It's just not going to happen. Um, and then I thought, oh, podcast. And it was people like yourself who are just putting your thoughts out into the world and doing it regularly. And I was like, well, that's cool. That's entertaining. I'm going to do that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, great. Yeah. Great. I mean, the production on your show is is really, really good. Like the way you weave the narrative with the music and it's just like a quality package right out of the gate. So good for you, man. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, yeah. I'd pay attention as well. Yeah. I mean, some people make amazing podcasts and, and, um, there's real inspiration there. You've done a really great job with it already. The one thing with uh, doing a podcast is is to not make it too quiet because people listen to them while right. they're out running. And I, That's true. I noticed this in the pandemic. <laughs> and I'd have headphones in and if they were my little isolation ones or if I had to use the the wired um, ear pods, um, if it was too quiet, I couldn't hear it over the traffic. And right. then I'd be like, well... I just took a mental note of that and I thought, no, compress the shit out of everything and try to make it quite right. loud. You know, I'm still figuring it out, but I think the second episode came out quite well. Everything is an evolution, right? It's like, but it's, it's just another example of you. you know, I always talk about putting yourself out there and it's like, you're just taking on all this ambitious stuff. I mean, we haven't even talked about Breed 7-7 yet. Yeah. <laughs> you joined this band um 
I mean, tell us, tell us about how that happens. Well, I mean, that is, and congratulations. Thank you. No, I mean that that that's also a wild, like full circle moment. I don't, I don't know if those guys and the the guys in the band know how meaningful it is for me, actually. Really, um, but uh, with you know, we're when sanctions fell away, South Africa's still behind, and so all the music magazines would come out late, and they're super expensive. So. I'd end up going to what, like a kilo bookshop. So you could buy a kilo of books um, for like nothing. It was like 10 Rand or something, which is like wow. $2 or whatever the equivalent was at the time. So you buy like, you just take them to the till <laughs> and they'll weigh them. <laughs> and so I'd get all the Kerrang and metal hammers from the UK stuff. And Breed 7-7 was on the cover um, or in the, on the CD on the cover, or there'd be a live review. And I'd see that name over and over and over and the dreadlocks, Danny, our guitarist, had dreadlocks. And I also had dreadlocks at the time. And I was like, that's cool, dreadlock dude, you know. <laughs> so it sticks in your head, right? Sure. Uh, and they were playing with cool bands like Life of Agony, Machine Head, you know, all these names, right? And so that sticks in your head too. And then came over to England, uh, start the Mariana Hollow. Richie, our guitarist, was married to a woman from Gibraltar, where they are from. She went to school with Paul, the singer, and Stuart, the bass player. I think that's how that works. And then Richie's like, oh, I know those guys. Um, and one minute silence. And I was like, oh, I've got a poster of one minute silence in my, my room. That's fucking amazing. You know? <laughs> well, I had, rather, as a teenager. Um, yeah. And then he, we, he's like, yeah, 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 I know those guys. And eventually he's like, oh, yeah, they've offered us a tour. Like we can go, They were doing an acoustic tour. Do you want to come and support us? And we were like, yes, of course. So we, we wow. developed an acoustic set of Marion Hollow songs, which is why we now have this new record out. That's, okay. that's like 10 years later. <laughs> uh, right. We went and played with Breed and made friends with them. And then after that, Danny does sound, our guitarist, does, he's a sound guy professionally. Uh, and every time I would go and do a gig with TMH or with another band, Danny's there doing the sound, you know? So I'd be like, how are you doing? Yeah, cool, cool, you know? Like, just catch up a little bit. And then he has a, he started this, uh, satanic metal band called the Heretic Order and they, Love their it. drummer was leaving and I thought, oh, maybe I'll go try out for that because I want to play something more extreme and try and, you know, have a challenge with the, the feet and the, the whole yeah way of playing metal so I, I prepped for the audition and it went fine but i, I wasn't a good fit because i'm not like i'm not that dude but then danny mm. called me and said oh actually we're doing we're getting breed back together do you would you be interested so i was like wow is the pope a catholic yeah of course <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah <laughs> she quote my father um and uh so yeah it took a little while and then they would start sending me, like, I had to do a little video audition. So I played, like, drums over some of their tracks just so they could be like, yeah, he kind of gets the idea. And then they'd send me new songs. And I'd start demoing it. And it was, you know, quite a long process of finding the right wavelength because they've been a band for such a long time and they know what they want. And I'm like, I'm learning, you know. You think yeah. you know stuff and then you join a band like that or established band who's done been there done that and you now you're learning all over again you know wow yeah man. and now we've finally kicked it off so there you go yeah what's it like getting that call i mean you just stop and go what is my life right now <laughs> yeah literally i'm like uh, i was ready to literally do the odd gig with tmh and just record at home that's where i was at with with music yeah i was just like this yeah. is hard you know and then now I get a chance at the age of 43 to go out and go and tour and do festival stages, you know? And that's, that's, that's all I can ask for. I think, it's, I think it's so cool. There was a post on social media like a couple of years ago, I think you made, mm. where you, you talked about, um, oh, no. I think you wrote it down. I don't see it in oh, front no. of me. <laughs> but you talked about how your chance at being a rock star had, is gone. So you're just going to enjoy life now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Two years later, here you are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think people, people who are listening, I think pessimism is underrated. <laughs> <laughs> do, 
do tell. Well, <laughs> it's I know it's a terribly unhealthy way to think, but if you think about it, you're like, oh, I'm just going to stop doing that now. That's not going to work. And then it happens, and it always, that always happens. So just be pessimistic, kids. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm totally joking. I know yeah. you are. I know you are. But it's like it's a, it's a way of letting go, though. It's like a way of releasing things, yeah. and it, it's funny how it comes back around when you do that. Yeah, and I, you start to learn that all the stuff you've been putting out there does matter, and it, someone has looked at it and has noticed, you know. Um, right. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I've had to like take my drumming up quite a few levels quite quickly because, you know, the guys before me in the band were incredible. So mm. to be trusted with that job is, uh, yeah, you know, don't, I don't take it very seriously. It's got to be a bit of a shot in the confidence. Yeah. Like it's got to boost you up a little bit. It didn't at first. <laughs> at first there was a lot of like, why can't I play the drums? <laughs> and then. Right. Oh, it's intimidating for yeah. sure. You know, but now I, you know, I can do stuff I couldn't do before, um, and it's great. You know, because now it's I'm always like, I want to really impress the band. Whenever I do something, I want them to go like, yeah, that's that's cool. You know, so that's like I, I mean, it's one of those cases where life requires nerves of steel. Exactly. <laughs> it's like okay, <laughs> I just got the gig with this band I've been following forever. It's going to demand a lot of me. Do I have the nerve to make this happen? And you did. So, dude, it's so great. It's so great. <laughs> I love it. It's an inspiration. It's an inspiration for everybody who might be in this position right now where they're hanging on, you know, feeling like it's too late, feeling like it's not possible. But, you know, you stay in the game, you keep working on your stuff, and then you just never know when opportunity is going to knock, right? Yep. And being prepared for that is everything. You know, it's why you woodshed every day. It's why you do all the recording you do. It's why you just sort of, even if you, even if you have a veneer of pessimism on things, you sort of hold on to that little bit of hope. And it's like, what do they say? Good luck is when preparation meets opportunity, something yeah. like that. It's like, you know, it's really impressive to me because I know personally how hard it can be to hold on. Especially as you get older, yeah. right? You begin to think it's just like, this is just never going to happen. And then you hang in and it does. And that's just really inspirational to me. Cool. Oh, that's great to hear. I mean, I certainly, uh, I bothered Emily Dolan Davis a lot as well for motivation <laughs> during the kind of lead up, you know, when I was having a shit time. I have to say she was very, uh, very helpful, you know, with kind of, keeping my attitude on on track and what have you emily is is such um she in a, in a weird way kind of a force of nature you know but yeah she's gone through it too yep. you know i mean she's had her own struggles and yet she maintains this attitude and this positivity and she has talked on my show about embracing the chaos you know and the great things that can, can come out of that so i mean she's a great person to turn to in those circumstances you know yeah because she, she's done it all too and she's been through it and it's like she will always encourage <laughs> it's, I love that about Emily yeah. no it's it, she is she's quite unique like that as well I think a lot of people would be like yeah yeah that's cool man you know but she'll take the time to to go in absolutely you know? so I, I yeah absolutely yeah. somebody else who will do that I think that I wanted to talk to you about is no less than Dave Elich himself oh yeah you did a lesson with Dave Elich. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Um, I wish I could do more, but uh, Dave is at a premium, yeah. but rightly so. Um, I, As part of the whole breed journey, I started to realize I was playing loads of double pedal, and I was really struggling with some of it, and I was like physically struggling with it. And mm. I, was, I was like, well, something's wrong. Like, um, and then I realized that, the way I'd been sitting at the drums and approaching them physically was was off and that I'd kind of had this approach for so, so long that it held me up and now it wasn't. Um, mm. And so he was part of the puzzle in, in kind of physically readdressing how I approached the, the kit, you know. It's common sense what he talks about, but 
it's not sim like how can I put it? It's not obvious, you know, because the way we live our lives, like I think most people just they just want to get something done and they don't think about how they're doing yeah. it. I think that's what we do with all kinds of stuff, even if it's like reaching down to get something out of the dishwasher, you know, right. to, to that level of that's we li- we're weird how we use our bodies, right? Um, it's right. It's just, it, we don't do it consciously. We don't think a lot about how, for those who don't know, Dave Ulich is one of the preeminent drum instructors on planet earth. And he's made a niche for himself as kind of the ergonomics and mechanics guy. So the physicality of playing the instrument, yeah. he's got a lot of interesting ideas about how to use your body more efficiently and, and effectively on the drum set. So plus he toured with Weezer and I think, mm. Katy Perry, like he's a, and the Mars Volta, like he's a, a monster yeah. player. Yeah. Frighteningly um, loud. But so oh, really? I, I saw him do a <laughs> clinic and I, I was sat quite near the stage and I had earplugs in and the snare was literally just like, just blinking kind of volume, you know, coming oh, off wow. the stage, not the mics, if you know what I mean. No, 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 I get yeah. it. I get it. And so for you two of, I mean, just, you just reached out to him and said, Hey, Dave, you got some yeah, time. Yeah. He'll, he's very responsive. Yeah. You know, like if he's sure. got the time, he'll, he'll do it. You know, he wants to help people and, and what have you. Um, and the whole thing is like the whole center of mass on the drum throne and the way mm. your, everything is kind of angled and moves off the central column of your body, you know, and what, like where your head sits. Like that's common sense in a way, but most people don't think yeah. about that. And we're all doing head down. We're dull slouching yeah. and yeah. It's really bad though at the drums. Like you lose many percentages of your power and facility just by doing that. And I, I still bet. do it, but I'm way more yeah. conscious now um, of just these little adjustments you know and he's he also adjusted my bass drum technique which was part of the the problem because i was the thing with drum knowledge right that i think is a little bit dangerous is like drum magazines or pub, whatever publications will put out these interviews and these little quotes from drummers and they'll be like rebound the pedal rebound the beater off the surface of the head but they don't talk about like what's happening to make that happen you know efficiently so i developed a technique where i was doing that but my leg was kind of in this weird position which eventually led to my whole posture being like top you know lopsided like off kilter and then kind i have of, yeah. back problems from that and then uh, da, 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 sure. da, 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 and it compounds and that and he basically it's all the simple stuff but like you know the way you move your leg the way the whole apparatus works what effect that's having that's what we talked about so yeah, I'm trying to incorporate it now. It's still, still fixing it, you know. Oh, that's so cool that I I would like to have him on my program actually. Yeah, do it. But I'd love to have him on and just talk about some of this. I mean, talk about his whole journey, but then some of this stuff that he talks about. Because especially as you get older, as I am, you know, your body becomes less effective. Mm. You know, you got aches, you got pains. I got all of those things. Not necessarily from drumming, just from being alive and being the age that I am, yeah. you know. And I'm trying to have a, to the extent that I have a career, a long one. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to be, still trying to improve. Yeah. And it's like, at a certain point, these physical motions really come into effect. And if you're like, I've played in rock bands and you're doing like, you're you're trying to be visual, right? And so it's, hard to do that and still be efficient yeah (laughs) with your technique and stuff right so it's interesting but the the other side of the dave elich thing and i i I scrolled through your social media quite a bit and prep for this but and uh feel free to not talk about this if you don't want to but this whole bit about the inner game of tennis and performance anxiety Mm. jumped Mm. out to me do you want to, can we talk about that or would you rather not talk about no, it? No, that's a, that's that's really key to the whole thing. That was one of the things I brought up with him because I said yeah, I'm having okay. physical problems or and then they turn into mental problems or the other way around depending on the day and I'm trying to figure I'm trying to figure out 
which is a chicken or egg. What what is happening here? You know, lots of doubt. I was doing loads of covers gigs where I was physically fatigued. I wasn't enjoying the material, all kinds of factors, like, and just really feeling bad about myself at the end of like mm. a night, you know, if I'd make really bad mistakes which i'd never done before and i was like oh okay something's going wrong here and then i had the whole the breed opportunity came up and i'll be quite transparent about it you know uh and i was really concerned about where you know i was like okay i can do this i understand what's required but can i do this like with my body right and then sure. i thought well i want to do this really badly so i'm gonna i'm gonna speak to a professional and so yeah i told him about it and the kind of negative self-talk that goes with it you know mm. and he was like read this book and the whole the book in summary is i mean there's a bit more to it than this of course but it's like um trying to find the natural childlike kind of instinct in executing a movement so it's that like relaxed concentration without too much thought going on um and why we end up in this basically a position of overthinking and self-critique um which is i think a cultural problem um and how to kind of you know when you're a child you just do shit it just happens you know right. um and right. sometimes and that's the best way to do it you don't think about it you don't think about the stroke and this is in tennis in the book um you just do it. And it's like, what are the results when you're not thinking about it? A lot of the time you get really good results, you know what I mean? And when you, right, you sure. learn how to kind of turn that on, that's what we want as a performer. So, yeah. Um, what, what I'm getting from that is like, uh, how can I, how can I summarize this? Um, it's some it's to do with how you're holding yourself up while you play which almost puts you into like a physical mental state for me at least hmm. um which where you feel comfortable and kind of powerful in yourself but also like right listening and the listening like have you ever do you like to sit in front of the tv with your your practice pad do you ever do that mm -hmm. it's I really fun done. it's my favorite thing in the world but I can't do it because I have a family. So when they go away, I watch a series and I'll chop out for like two hours on my pad. It's it's very yeah, loud. It's really you know. loud. <laughs> and it's so <laughs> fun. And then I go play drums. If I have the weekend to myself, then I'm like, oh my God, my technique is so much better. So I realized that the TV is turning my brain off to the right de degree. So I'm not really concentrating super hard and you know, I'm enjoying myself. So to find that when you're performing i'm looking for that now and i think is there something to do i think it loosely ties into the what the inner game of tennis is talking about you relaxed concentration kind of state so you it, whether it's something that you're looking at or listening to your brain is focused entirely in one direction and it's your body is starting to is just executing because it knows how to do it you know you have to practice of course but your body now knows how to do it but if you're thinking about it, mm. then your body, like the, you have these two things that are at war, you know, and it happens really quickly. You can't judge. You have to learn to not judge. It's like you do, you fuck up. You miss a crash. Don't judge it. It's gone. Drop a stick in oh my, my case. Oh, the stick drop. I, I'm actually going to practice <laughs> dropping sticks. Do you ever do that? Because I'm shit at getting a new one. I don't need to practice. I do it so often that it just happens all the time. Because I'm always in this position, a lot of the time I'm in this position where I'm playing a backline kit or somebody else's kit. And, you know, things aren't always set up just the same way. No. And so, uh, you know, a crash is one inch in a different direction and you're hitting your stick off it and you lose it or whatever. But there's an art to dropping and mm, recovering. I know, I know. <laughs> You can't stop playing. You have to keep going. Um, sorry to take that in a weird in a weird direction, but I get what you're saying about if you come into it and you are in a not a great headspace, or you're you're prone to being very self critical and you're worried about it going into yeah. the gig, and then you do make an even an imperceptible mistake. Nobody else would even notice it, but yeah. you know, and then 
you can go down that rabbit hole so quickly and then you become so hyper focused on your playing that you're not no. playing <laughs> you know you're all wrapped up in your head and things can go downhill very quickly from there in my experience yes, at least ab absolutely yeah um i think that centeredness physical physical centeredness on the drums is like the most important thing to setting that up to happen um but there's other mm. things you can do to like clear your mind out but honestly when you start playing in a gig everything's chaos and it's very hard to like be totally centered in your mind when the show starts for example as you know so it's yeah. like okay if i feel good and i just maintain a centered posture and approach so for example you know when you do those fills where you like Oh, it's really you. It feels like the whole drum kit is like two miles wide, just going. <laughs> yeah, you know. I don't do yeah, a lot but of those fills. Even in certain contexts, <laughs> some stuff just feels like it's going to be really hard. But that's because of the adrenaline yeah, of and course. all the crap in your head. And I found that, like, if I just go centered, hands are centered physically, none of this flailing, and I just what like my eyes just guide me, kind of thing it starts to work and then I'm like, and then I start to feel centered in my head and right. then it starts to work. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying it won't fuck up after that, but it's, uh, it's way better, you know? Oh, it's so much a mental game. It really is. Like I, I say often that you go see a band place, particularly like a, a band of pros and they make it look effortless and easy and seamless, but there's so much chaos happening on stage that you don't see most mm. of the time, you know? And when you are playing shows, you realize that a lot of the time you're hanging on by a thread, mm. <laughs> you know, trying to make it look like you're not. But if you are of a certain temperament, which I am, or if you are, if you're very demanding of yourself, which yeah. I am, and critical of yourself, yes. which I am, same. That can really be like a millstone around your neck. Like when you're playing gigs, it's really like, it's a thing that a lot of people have to reckon with is the mental side of this. It's not just, it, we, we put it in a musical context cause that's our frame of reference mm. for it. But so it is in sports or so it can be in being a speaker or a presenter yeah. or whatever. The mental side of it is, can be a real challenge. It's, <laughs> it's this is like a learned behavior that it's it's weird isn't it it's very strange sure. that we all have this the same learned behavior um but you have forgotten not you personally but one has forgotten um how to be a child about it and why you did it in the first place mm. and i'm very about recapturing that now you know i and it's not easy but cool. i think i've made a little bit of progress towards getting that back and not Doing social media videos has been a part of that, <laughs> I can tell you. Really? Yeah, because I needed to be a little bit more pure, you know. Hmm. I set up the camera the other day. I was like, oh, I love this song. I haven't heard it for ages. I'm going to do a drum cover. And I recorded it, and I was not happy with my performance. And I sat there going and feeling terrible. And I was like, I'm not that drummer. I'm not a jukebox. I am me. <laughs> And uh, some people are good at being a jukebox, and I wish I was that, but I need the context, I need the inspiration, I need the moment. I think mm -hmm. when I'm having a good time, a good day, I'm so much better on stage than you will see in my videos. And I think that is because it's in the moment. That's the moment, and then the moment is gone. And the next day yeah. is a different moment, and I don't know. I think we need to remember that with music and stuff because yeah doing a video for social media automatically you become critical because yeah. you want it to be perfect exactly right yep and and all right off the bat you're not in a childlike mentality anymore it's performative it's pressured and it's the same thing as recording it's like like i find a lot of times if i'm recording it's a I'm stiff, you know, I'm, I'm yes. pressurized. I'm tight because, you know, it's gotta be right. And, and playing live is when it's going well is a much looser and more organic and just a better feeling 
when it's not going well, it's awful. <laughs> but I can see that. You know, if your whole if doing a, a a drum cover isn't inspiring or fulfilling for you, then what is the point, right? Yeah, exactly. It was at a certain point, but now it's not. Yeah. You can so easily get caught up in this pressure to have to be online and have to be a presence online and it's like you have to do this you know you have to do you have to be on social media posting all the time and this and this and this and it's like i, I don't know if that's actually true no <laughs> i don't think i don't know i i was having a chat with someone the other day and my harsh view is i think we should turn it all off <laughs> like i i tend to agree i, I don't really like have any moderated view on that i actually this last few weeks i've decided that it, it should probably be switched off <laughs> it's a fine line because so much of it is toxic and pointless but then the other side of it is i'm talking to you right now as a result of well <laughs> so. yeah okay yeah it's it's like we can't change the course of of history but uh i think that not the internet but social media that's what I mean, you know. Yeah. We can still do yeah. business and c communicate and do these things. And people are going to listen to us and go, this guy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. But uh, I, I don't know. I'm not going to get into this topic. I'm going to stop talking about it. I've, but with the Olympic Games, it's like the world is down a vat of lemon juice and salt, and we all need to hear about it. It's all being regurgitated. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what? <laughs> Why? Why are you so who who hurt you? <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I, I'm Show like, this is doll. fucked. This is fucked. We're arguing about like people moving. That's what. That's what we're arguing about. Is people right. moving, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we're arguing about some pictures and some some colors. <laughs> like that's what we're fucking scared of. Okay, all right. So I think we should just switch it off because of the. Cap Sorry, this, I'm getting really worked up now. But uh, yeah, and that's going back to the music thing. I think everything gets dissected, and it's just too much. It's too much, you know. Uh, mm. And going back to the podcast thing again, the whole thing is to bottle a time where it was um, that that pure thing was there, has pure energy. And the chats I have with these people are so cool. Like you know what it feels like when you have a really cool chat with someone on your podcast. Afterwards, oh, yeah. you're like, yeah. yeah, fuck, you know, like you feel better than actually sometimes after a gig it's really nice to have that just that pure connection it's being in flow i think yeah like the the good episodes have a flow to them that you can try to manipulate but it doesn't work it's like it has to be an organic thing right that's the challenge of of hosting a podcast episode with a guest is like allowing it to go where it seems to want to go. And I'm not always great at that. It's a thing that you learn over time. And I'm a bit out of practice, to be honest, right now. But yeah, there's something really special about that. And I've had the experience. It's cool. Mm. And it must be fun for you to be talking to some of these people. I know that, you've, that you're friends with some of the guests that you've, you've lined up, but it must be fun to be talking with some of those folks. Yeah. About that time. It's... You know what's really cool <clears throat> is like there's almost different levels of guest. So there's the ones who are my friends, and that goes usually how you would imagine, you know. And then there's the, <laughs> you know, because it, it's it's a bit easier. And then there's guys who I know that they're quite famous, um, and it's really good. But it's just different, you know. Like it's I can't put it. It's probably because they do a lot of press. That's probably what what mm. it is. Um, and so it just has a different energy. And then there's people who I know, or I don't really know, or you know, we had like one interaction or two, and it was many years ago. Uh, or in the case of one of them, it was almost like our first conversation. And we felt like, I felt like we were real buds, you know, like doing it. Really? And that was really yeah. cool. So there's all these, you never know what is going to happen, you know. But there's, I've started to realize there's these different sort of situations that, kind of play out you know people surprise you everyone has been oh, very 100%. very kind and very cool uh, it's been so good but pe it's just so surprising how cool some people have been and they don't even really know who i am you know 
I know. I've had the same experience. And and people will come out and tell you stuff on on a, I don't like the word interview, but in a, a scenario like this, but you have no idea about, and people will just begin to tell you stories. You're like, wow, I didn't see that coming. And the game is to just let them tell that story, you know, without trying not to get in the way. And it's there's an art to it that you just kind of learn over time. But I'm excited about what you're doing. I think this is a really cool project. And and I'm I have no connection at all to the South African music scene of the nineties, two thousands. But you know, any topic brought with enthusiasm and, and passion in the way that you bring it is going to be interesting. So I'm encouraging everybody to check out the Caught in Time podcast with Adam Stanley. Thank you. Really, really well put together and a really compelling niche. So good for you, man. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully hopefully it, it resonates, it, you know. If it resonates with you, it, it will find its audience out there. You know, it really will. Yeah. I, there was right. someone I wanted to interview from who was an industry person rather than a musician, and I will speak to them. And I was like, you were very impressive, basically. What you pulled off was like, no one else did it. And she was like, Oh, I don't know if anyone gives a shit. <laughs> and I was like, I think they will because you're a business like force to be reckoned with, you know. And and then yeah. she went and thought about it, you know. And she came back, and then she heard my little trailer episode, and then she said, "Oh, I would listen yeah. to this. This is great." <laughs> and I was like, "You see, you see, <laughs> right. people will your maybe you'll be the most listened to episode because of." You're not talking about music. You're talking about broader things that people could maybe use. So I'm hope hopefully she comes on. <laughs> oh yeah, you'll get her, man. You'll get her. You'll get her. But I don't want to take any more of your time. I appreciate you giving this much to us. And um, sorry it took this long. I I wasn't doing guest interviews for a long time, you know. So it, it's like I had to shift gears. But uh, I'm glad we had this chance to actually talk face to face for a while. Yeah, amazing. I'm so grateful. Thank you. It's uh, it's nice to be recognized and thought of a little bit. Um, yeah, so I appreciate you giving a shit. <laughs> I do. I do indeed. And I and I appreciate you giving one about my little program. Yeah, too. man. I <laughs> so enjoyed it. I, it was a, you guys had a good chat. Yeah, who was the woman you were talking to? Um, I think the lady on the cruise ship. It was Kay. Yeah, it was Kay Hal. Um, and your chat about... <laughs> about people on Instagram really made me laugh. It was very true, but it really made me laugh too. And I was like, yes. She, uh, I know. I, you have to be so careful about not being too critical, but you, oh man, you see some stuff out there yeah. and you just sort of shake your head. Yeah, but. we don't need to carry on on there, but um, I just, we don't. I'm just saying I appreciate the level of chat. <laughs> thank you. And I appreciate you being part of the show. So thanks thank a you, lot, John. man. Stay on the line. We'll do some actors. Okay. For the moment, though, thanks ever so much, and say goodbye, Adam Stanley. Goodbye, Adam Stanley. All right. Until next time. (laughs) Cheers. Cheers, man. And now, an Easter egg for Ken the Zen. Hi, Ken the Zen.